Okay, this is T, T test for two independent samples. T tests for two T test for two independent sample means. Now take note, the word here is independent, meaning to say the two means are not directly related. Meaning to say there is no, at least there is no represent, there is no uh, member in some in sample one that happens to be also a sample member of sample two. Okay, uh, at least that's what we're going to to consider. So if we're going to talk about sample of two independent means, it's like talking about example in our illustration like this. Mean here refers to the average, uh, the average difference of the sample means of the two groups. So example, you get the the difference of all the the two sample means that you can get. So, so population A, population B, get the difference of each population. And then get the average of the differences. That's the mean difference of the two sample groups. And then if you are going to identify here a sample, this is a particular mean, so illustrated as sigma x bar 1 minus x bar 2. Meaning to say, this is a difference, a particular difference of two independent sample means away from the average independent sample means of your two samples so basically this is uh this is the, the deviation of this uh different sample difference sample mean from the average sample means so i'm uh, simply referring the distribution here is that in relation to the sample means of the two independent groups the average here is zero that's the average uh uh, difference of the sample means, the two uh, sample means, and then this particular difference is uh, described as to how far it is away from the average difference of the sample means. Okay, at least that is how it is illustrated, uh, how we can show it in illustrations. Uh, illustration way. Now let's talk about the standard error of difference. Now we understand last time that we took the standard error also. Now this time we will also have the standard error of difference the standard error of difference is symbolized as sigma x bar minus x bar one mean one and mean two now how is this even possible remember our standard error before was given to us as sigma x bar which is the population standard deviation divided by uh, the square of the sample size. That is our standard error before. Now, in the event that we are now talking about two sample means, if we're going to manipulate this one, if we will square both sides, we will get uh, we will get the square. Uh, we will square both sides here, square, and then also this one, square. So basically, what we will have is we have our our sample mean here. Now, if we square both sides. This is going to be Q square X bar is equal to sigma square all over N. As we'll extract the root here, so this is going to be exponent and this one, the, the denominator's radical symbol will be removed. And then applying the square root here, again, back, so this is going to be canceled out. So you have sigma square bar is equal to the square root of sigma square all over n so where is this going to take us in other words to solve for this one for the standard error it's simply standard error applying this concept since there are two means uh, mean of the standard error for the first one and the second one since it's already combined this is by the way two so we'll have now our formal for standard error to be the standard error for the mean one over n plus the sigma squared for 2 over n2. So this is now our formula for the standard error. 
Okay? But, this uh, formula does not operate the way we used it before. There is a much more, uh, say, there, there is a much more thing to consider in applying this concept. Now, I will just uh, bring you the, the that later for a while. Okay, uh, before we move further, if we're going to recall, we know that if we compare two sample means, example, mean of the sample, mean of the first sample group, and then mean of the second sample, when we compare that one, uh, our formula before for one sample is just like this, remember? Sigma, or rather, for big sample group, that is Z equals mean minus mu divided by the standard error that was our, our formula before comparing one sample mean to the group uh to the population's mean and then using our standard error here but modifying this formula now into big sample group this time we're comparing two means uh, the means of two sample group for group for bigger sample sample size it's going to be z is equal to mu1, I mean mean1 minus mean2. Okay, so we are comparing now two means minus, so instead of having one, since there are already two population, the mean of population one and then mean of population two, divided by this time our standard error, which is already this, which is uh, written to be this form. Okay, this is now our new formula. For bigger population group. Which is, you know, that this one can be substituted with this uh, term inside. Because this formula or this value is just equal to this. So you can replace this one by this expression. But there's more to this one. This is for the large, uh, for a z-test for two large samples. So if you have two large samples, then you can use this one. Otherwise, we will use t distribution. Now, there's what we call the separate variance t-test. What is the separate, uh, separate variance t-test? Please kindly take note of all the terms and the formulas that uh, I have place here because later on we'll go back to some of the formula and I cannot actually, since I only have limited the space here, so I'll have to remove or erase things from time to time. So for a small sample t-test, uh, example, if your sample size is less than 30, so we cannot use the previous one I gave you, which is the Z, because it's intended for at least 30 and more. So what we're going to do now, the so-called Separate variance t-test. What is the separate variance t-test? For separate variance t-test, our given formula is simply with the assumption now that the population's variance, take note, I'm talking about variance but not standard deviation. Take note also that squaring your, sum, your standard deviation will give you your variance because the square root of the variance is the standard deviation. So whenever the given is Standard deviation, you just square it, that is the variance already, <clears throat> which is denoted as uh, Q squared. That's why in our notation, it's Q squared or sigma squared or S squared for sample group. So for example, our formula is T is simply equivalent to, this is for a separate variance or simply computing the difference of two means for, for minimal samples at least less than 30. So we have mean one, minus mean 2 minus the difference of the means of the population, mean 1 and mean 2, divided by our, since uh, the event here is we are now taking the means from the sample group, we can also apply our knowledge before, we can also estimate the standard error by means of the variance of the sample. In the event that the variance of the population is not available, and since we're already taking it down to a sample group, 
we will consider the mean, uh, the variance of the sample group. So instead of having the sigma square to be our denominator here, we can actually adopt the uh, S, uh, the variance of the sample group, which is S squared 1 all over N1 plus the variance of the second group divided by N2. So this is the variance for... I mean, this is for the first group, sample group, and then this is for the second sample group. It looks so simple like this, but we need to understand that the S squared here is not an ordinary variance right away. There is what we call the pooled variances. In this formula, uh, the formula is called the separate variance t-test because each sample variance is separately divided by its own sample size. Unfortunately, this formula does not follow the t-distribution in a simple way. So this formula accordingly does not um, subscribe to the usual interpretation we have for the t-tests. Later, I will explain to you why. Therefore, we will post this one for a while. And then by assuming homogene uh, homogeneity of variances, assuming that the two population variances are equal. So with the assumption that the two population had equal variances, okay, meaning to say the variance of the population group one is equal to the variance of the population of second uh, variance, so that is homogeneity of variances, meaning to say one variance is, I mean, one, uh, one common variance for two population. To make it easy to use the t-distribution for our critical values, the modification constraint concerns only the denominator of the formula and requires a different way of estimating the standard error or the difference. So our standard error now here is quite different. Instead of using this one, we are going to modify it. We call this act as pooled variances. Because this modified was of estimating the standard error involves pooling together, uh, we pull together, it's like we combine uh, our two variances, which are actually variances adopted from the population version, variances considering the homogeneity of variances. We can do it manually. So here is our formula to do the pool variances estimate. So remember our concept here is we estimate the standard error. But since it's already two sample group and we combine the standard error for two sample group, that's why we are going to pull this together. We call this the pooled variance estimate. Pulled. Then we pull, we, we combine them. Pulled variance. Variances estimate. Take note, this is still the concept of standard error. That's estimating the standard error. So our formula, uh, this is because of the assumption that the variances of the population are equal. So what we're going to do is like this. The formula for pool variances is T equals the difference of the two sample means minus the difference of the population mean divided by, this time, our denominator appears to be this way. S squared P, that means to say the pool variance for the first sample group divided by N1 plus the variance of the, the pool variance of the second sample group, which is uh, divided by N2. So this is the, the new formula as we try to pull together the estimated or the standard error. So we have already this scenario. But we have to understand that SP here are the standard, the pool variance has a meaning. If you look at this one here, the denominator for a while, this is, I'm walking you now to the derivation of the formula. I'll try to remove this one. Okay. So you notice here, the pool variances, the numerator in our expression here inside are common. It's the same for both sides. We can factor it together. We can factor it out. So instead of having that one, we can have x bar one minus x bar two minus the difference of the means, the population means, divided by, we factor the SP, the full variance here. So we have full variance 
then you have 1 over n1 plus 1 over n2. Okay, so this is now our new formula. Okay, this is the formula to be used. But we do not know this, the pool variances. So instead of before computing the t value right away and compare it to the theoretical value to make judgment whether it is significant or not in our test hypothesis, we still need to have an additional computation which is called the pool variances. This is called the pool variance. Pool variance. But there is a separate formula for a pool variance. Okay, but take note of this formula. This is not the formula that we need, but in order for us to apply this, we need to know first this uh, notation, which is called the pooled variance. So how do we solve that one? There is a separate formula for that. For pooled variances, we understand that, remember last time when we solved for the standard deviation, or at least for the variance, variance is simply the sum of the square deviation divided by n minus 1, which is, it turns to be our degree of freedom. The, remember, degree of freedom is just simply n minus 1. Bf is equal to n minus 1. That's the degree of freedom uh, associated to our t-test before. We all know also that sum of squared uh, difference or simply Square or variance is equal to SS divided by N minus 1. And minus 1 is actually where the degree of freedom is from. And then SS here, that is the sum, the summation of the square difference. So remember, let's have a to compute the variance. Uh, we subtract all the squares away from the mean, and then we square it. That's the meaning of the SS. The square, the sum, uh, the summation of the square deviation. So we have it in this form. Now, in the event of like this, we can already modify and solve for, look for the formula for this one. How do we get this one? The formula for this, the pool deviation S squared P is simply N minus 1, minus 1 here. I know the sample size minus 1 for the first group. Then you have S squared, the variance for the first group. Plus, the same thing will happen here, N2 minus 1 and then S squared the variance of the second group divided by the joint uh, degree of freedom. So N minus 1 plus N, that's N minus 1 plus N minus 2 minus 2. Because remember, it's like, it's like this. Uh, our S squared is equal to N minus 1 times S squared divided by n minus 1, uh, n minus 1. Since there are two, so we, we combine, so it's like this. To get the s squared, the pool variances, that's, we call, that's why we become uh, n minus 1. This is for the first uh, group, and then plus, I need more space. So you have n1 minus 1, s1 squared. That's the first one, and then n minus 1, plus n minus 1, uh, 2. This is the second group, then s squared minus 1 over n minus 1. Because we pulled together, so this is the... First, the first sample and then the second sample. As we combine that one, that's why once this is combined, the result is this. Okay? So which is now the formula for the uh, pooled, var pooled variances. We have already, so in our t-test computation, we need this value. We need this particular value. So let's now work this one up. So basically, instead of doing this formula, we can rewrite the whole formula in details. So instead of having this one, I can rewrite the formula this one, uh, this way. Mean 1 minus mean 2 minus the population difference of the two pop the population means divided by the square root. So I'm going to replace now my full variance with this one. 
which is n minus 1 s 1 squared divided by ah, sorry plus n2 minus 1 s 2 squared divided by n1 plus n2 minus 2 times 1 over n plus 1 over n2. So that is now our modified or at least our formula in details and detail form. So if you wanted to go do one-time computation, so you can do use it this way. But uh, simultaneously, you can perform it this way. You solve separately the whole variance first and then plug into our to this formula and then solve for the t. But if you wanted to do it one time, we will use this formula quickly solve for the pull uh, pull variance Automa automatically from this formula here we will right away to have the computed t in the event that our sample size is or for the formula for equal sizes meaning to say sample uh, sample group one and sample group two have the same size equal sizes can you take note of this formula? Okay, we will use this formula later when we will do the actual the hypothesis testing. So, in the event that our formula or our um, samples have the same or equal sizes, the formula would appear to be this way. Formula for equal sample size. Okay. So the formula is like this. For pull deviation, uh, for pull variance, for this part here, the SP, S, uh, the S sub P, the pull variance, is simply um, S squared 1 plus S squared 2 divided by N. Why uh, divided by 2? Why this is possible? Because... Why is that even possible? Uh, yeah. Since the pull deviation here are, are the same, so we don't need to get already the, the deviation or the DF from both separately. We can just have it in this form. So you have the variance of the first sample group and then plus variance of the second sample group divided by two. That is it. Our um, sample sizes are the same. Now, to compute for the t value, it would all simply appear to be this way. x bar 1 minus x bar 2 minus the difference of the population means divided by, instead of having this one, we'll just simply have it s squared 1 plus s squared 2 divided by 2 times 1 over n1 plus 1 over n2. By the way, this is a radical symbol. So that is our formula. Or to simply modify this one further, it's going to be like this. X bar 1 minus X bar 2 minus the difference of the population means divided by the square root of what? S squared 1, this one. Oh, yeah. Since this can be further combined, so as you combine this together, this will become 2 over n. And cancel the 2 here, that's why the result will be like this. S1 plus S squared 2 divided by n. Because what will happen, once you multiply this, this is going to become 2 over n, since our n here are equal sizes because of this uh, assumption. So once you have it this one, this will become 2 over n. Cancel the 2 here. That's why once multiplied, this one times 1. That's why you have it this form. And then 2 times, I mean, 1 times n. That's why you have the parameter here is n. This is now the formula in case 
our sample, we have equal sample sizes. But if not, then we will stick to this formula. Okay? I think we're good to go now from here. We will do now the call the calculation. Let's say we have a group of like this. The mean of the first group is group uh, mean one is 10. Mean two is uh, let's say mean two is 12. Okay. And then our variance one, variance one is a standard deviation. Let's start. Standard deviation one is four, and then standard deviation two is five. Now let us solve for the t value. So applying this formula, our mean one is 10 minus our mean two is 12 minus the population mean. Let's assume that we, we don't know the population mean. Let's just put it zero minus zero. Okay? For the population, let's assume that the population doesn't have any difference at all in terms of their means. Divided by our denominator, the very take note, this is S squared, which this is only S. This is variance, this is standard deviation. So what we need to do is we square the value here. So instead of 4, we will square the 4. 4 squared will give us 16. Now this one also 5 squared will give us 25. So our value here will become the square root of, so that means to say, considering that S squared 1 is equal to S1, we square this value. So if the value here is 4, squaring that one, that's why we have 16. The same goes also for the other one, S squared, uh, S squared 2, which is, we will square the S squared 2 value. So that's why you get here, uh, 5 square, which is 25. So this is 20, this is 16 plus 25. What are our sample sizes? I we did not assume the sample size. Let's say the total sample size is, or our sample size is 15. N equals 15. Take note, N1 is equal to N2. And the assumption was it's 15. So this is divided by 15. So what will be the result? This is going to be negative 2 over 16 plus 25. That is, wait, let's divide 16, 1, carry 1, 30, 13, 41. Is it 41 over 15? Anyway, the value for this one is, if you solve that, 16 plus 25, 16 plus 20. 5 divided by 15, that's 2.773. And then we will, approximately, this is the square root of 2.773, 2.73 or 7.33. Which is, if you will divide this, approximately, this is going to be, approximately, it's going to be negative 1.21. So you have now your computed T. What you're going to do, you just compare this to your uh, critical T to test your hypothesis whether you reject or accept the null hypothesis. Okay? At least this is how we're going to apply when we have equal variances. Interpreting the result, let's look, let's look at this. If the two groups are same size, this formula simply simplifies the 2n and n plus n equals 2, so which means minus 2 which equals to 2n minus 2 for the present example. For the present example, df is 2n minus 2 equals to 30 minus 2. We use the conventional alpha unit to form the two-tailed test. If we have equal uh, equal sample sizes, ah, okay. If we have equal samples, so that's going to be 2n minus 2. Take note of this. To know the DF or the degree of freedom, remember it in doing and identifying the critical value, we use the degree of freedom versus the alpha for equal sizes or equal size. DF is simply N plus N minus 2, which is equivalent to 2N minus 2. 
this is the formula to solve for the df for equal size uh, uh, equal sample sizes and then df for an equal meaning to say your sample size is not the same one group is 10 the other group is 12 the df is simply uh, n1 plus n2 minus 2 okay now for our example example this one our in this example our sample size earlier was uh, our n1 example our population our sample size one is if it's the same example sample size is 10 so n1 is equal to n2 equals 10 so what we're going to do, that's 10 plus 10 minus 2, so we have 20. So 20 versus the degree of free, the versus alpha of 0 0.05, using the T value, you can already look for your critical weight. So if this is the information, our N1 is equal to N2 is equals 10. Our degree, what will be the degree of freedom if this is our data? Um, yeah, there's um, minus two. So DF here would become, uh, wait. The formula is 2 times 10 minus 2 is simply 20 minus 18. So you have 18. So you, what is the T critical? Our DF is 18. Look at your T table. And then our alpha is 0 0.05. But the degree of the T critical is with T critical, 18, then Two tailed, assuming that this is this is two tailed. A two tailed, our T critical is eighteen, then two tailed alpha ten five percent five percent that's two point two point one zero one. That is our value. Two point yeah, two point one zero one. Now comparing this value. Oh, where's that value? Ah, I think I raised it. What's the value here earlier? Negative 1.21. So if we compare this one now and this, the critical value, we take note this is uh, positive. It's directional. What happened? If we use the blah, 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 blah. Uh, since it's two-tailed, we can drop, actually, since it's two-tailed, this value is actually located in the t this in our uh, distribution like this. Since this is positive, negative, so it could be since it's negative, we have it. Our rejection region is two. They have here the negative critical value of negative two point one zero one, and the other one the positive two point one zero one. Since this is negative, we reflect it here. So this is the rejection. Reject, and then this area here up. To this one, the middle is the accept. So decision, decision time. Let's compare this one. Negative, let's drop the, the negative, or we can have negative 1.21, which is greater. Negative 1.21 or negative 2.102 in value. So in principle, if you're going to look at it, it's like this. To make it a lot easier and more comprehensible to, to I mean, manageable to understand. We drop the negative value because uh, it's easier to compare now which one is bigger if we are in the positive side. Uh, let's just do it in, in the negative side. Okay, let's take this. This is negative two point. That's the critical, but the computed value was... Okay, so we need to say there are two rejection digits, negative, then positive 2.101, because it's too tame. So the rejection region, fall, I mean, the acceptance is falling on this area. Okay? Now, in the event in our computation, this value is negative 1 point. So where should I uh, found this value? To the left of negative 1.01 or to the right? <laughs> okay, so that's approximately found here. Let's say this is negative 1.21. So in other words, this T value falls on the acceptance. Our decision in this case is accept. Accept null. Meaning to say, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. There is no sufficient evidence claiming that our, uh, there is no sufficient evidence that our claim is significant statistically. Okay? 
I hope I'm making sense here. Did you understand? This is now the T, this is comparing the T critical and then the T computed to make decision whether we accept or reject the null hypothesis. So take note, this area here is one, this is the rejection area. This area here. The same goes also here. This is also the rejection region. Now, this area is the acceptance region. Since our T computed landed on this area, the acceptance region, that's why our decision is we fail to reject the null hypothesis. Accept null. In the event of this, that we accepted the null, what type of error is most likely will be committed? Pardon, sir. Since this is the, the, the result now, what's the type of error? Type, type 1 error. error. Meaning to say, what is type 2 error? Accept the null. Okay, it is accepting the null hypothesis when it is supposed to, to reject. Be okay? So at least this uh, roughly, uh, I. Uh, I have walked you to our uh, discussion here. Any question? So we will be asked what type of error you just always remember. If I accept when it is to be rejected, then type 2. If I reject when it is supposed to be accepted, type 1. Do not forget that. Excuse me, sir. Mm -hmm. Which one? Can you have a problem? We don't have a problem here that this is still an example of t-test. Uh, comparing means for two independent sample t-tests. Uh, either equal sample sizes or unequal sample sizes. Oh, okay. It depends on that. We quite modified the formula depending on our sample sizes, if it's equal or not equal. Okay, sir. Thank you. Okay, I think we can have now our actual first example. Wait, what is this quasi-experiment? Okay, I would like to share this. Uh, let's try to solve this one. I'll, I'm going to give you some exercises. Can someone read the problem, the one I shared here in uh, the chat? Someone, uh, please read it. For a two group of experiment, n1 is equal to 14 and n2 is equal to 9. How many degrees of freedom would be associated with the gold divariance t test? B, what are the total critical t values if alpha is equal to 0 0.05 if alpha is equal to 0.01? Okay. Let's answer the problem. First is what uh, how, how many degree of freedom would be associated with the pool variances? Take note your sample size is 14, uh, sample size 2 is 9. So in this case, our variances are our Sample sizes are not equal. So how what how do you compute now your DF, your degree of freedom? Since our sample size is not equal. So we have here the two options. We may use this one or we may use this. But since it's uh, unequal variances, then we are going to follow the uh, we're going to follow this. N1 plus N2 minus 2. Okay? So what is your DF now? What will be the DF now? Uh, presenting our uh, 21. Yes. 21. Okay, 21. our DF is, it's not 21, uh, oh wait, yeah, okay, that's 21. It's basically 14 plus 9 minus 2, which is 24 minus, uh, 23 minus 2, that's why you have 21 as your DF. What is the critical value using two tail tests if the alpha is set to 0 0.05, 5% level of significance? What's the what is the critical value? Two tailed and then alpha is zero point zero five. If the DF is two point zero eight one. So this is now your basis. If the computed T it happens to be greater than this value, then reject the null. Otherwise, uh, fail to reject the null hypothesis. What about if the test is said to be at alpha zero point zero one? What's the value? 2.831. Okay, that's 2.831. Okay. So
So I think uh, we answered this uh, problem. Let's uh, look at another problem. The weights of 20 men have a standard deviation SM is equal to 30 LB and the weights of 40 women have SW is equal to 20 LB. What is the pooled variance 2, two squared P of these two groups? Okay, so you're asked to solve for the pool variance. There are two formulas for two variance, uh, two uh, pool variances, correct? Uh, you will use, uh, that depends upon whether your sample sizes are equal or unequal sample sizes. In this case, do we have equal sample sizes or unequal sample sizes? We have an equal, right? Unequal. Men is 20, while the women is 40. By the way, that is uh, S sub M. Because the chat box here does not, uh, uh, does not, uh, support it is not supported with exponent exponent subscript of superscript that's why it appears to be sm but it would be written this way look at this one uh, that is supposed to be s sub m equals 30 pounds and then s sub w this is for the men and then this is the standard deviation for the men and then the standard deviation for the women is 20 pounds okay and then we have an equal variances our n1 how many men were there there are 20 men and then women there are 40 this is the standard division for the 40 in the middle and then we don't have their means actually we don't need the means for the uh pool variances let's solve for the poor pool variances there were two formula for pool variances s squared p is equal to what's the formula uh n1 minus 1 s squared 1 plus n2 minus 2 s squared 2 divided by n1 plus n2 minus 2 this is for an equal variances right because if it's equal variance or equal an equal size uh, sample sizes i'm referring to sample size this is the formula but the alternative, this is for equal sample size. And then for an equal sample size, uh, an equal sample size, I think there is no, there is only one formula, sorry, whether equal or an equal sample sizes, you can just uh, manage to have it, uh, to have the same formula. Oh, what's the formula for, yeah, the formula for equal is s squared p is s squared 1 plus s squared 2 divided by n, right? Am I correct? Yeah, I remember this is for, uh, this is an equal, an equal, and this is for equal samples, sample size. So an equal, we have it this way, an uh, equal sample size is this one. Oh, we have the formula earlier. So what is now our standard? What is our pool variance? S squared P for this problem. For this one. So first, our sample size is, sample size 1 is 20. So that's 20 minus 1. What is the, take note here. Our, uh, what do you call this one? Our sample size, I mean, the standard deviation for the first sample group is 30 pounds. But take note, this is, S here is standard deviation. But our formula is talking about variance, correct? So we need to translate this into variance. Remember that S squared is simply, uh, S squared is just simply, we square the standard deviation. So we need to say the variance, to get the variance, we will just square the standard deviation. If this example, the standard deviation is 30, so that's going to be 30 squared, which is S squared now is equal to 900 pounds. Okay? And then for, this is for S squared 1. For S squared 2, that is simply 20 squared would give us 400 pounds. So in this case, our S squared 1 is 900. 
plus our um, sample size number 2 is 4t minus 1 times the squared the, the variance is 400 divided by 20 plus 4t minus 2. What is our pool deviation, our pool variance? That's going to be 19 times 900 plus 39 times 400 divided by 2060 is 58, 58 equals 500. What's your answer? What's the pool variance? 79. In two decimal places, we have 79. So this is our pool variances. This is what you're going to plug into the formula of T to look for the T value or the critical, the tabulated T. Right, let's have this one last example before we'll do the actual hypothesis testing. Read the problem. The two groups in a psychology experiment both have the same variance S squared this is equal to 135. What is the pooled variance? Note, it doesn't matter how large the groups are, e are or even whether they are the, the same size. So what's the answer? Can you give me the answer? What is the formula for pooled variance? There you go. Is this, can you recall this formula? Pooled variance for equal sizes. Uh, same sizes, that's uh, variance 1 plus variance 2 divided by Sample size. Ah, it's divided by 2, not n. The answer is 135 because that's already in variance form. So variance form is 135. Since the, they are equal sizes, variance 1 and variance 2, that's 135. 135 plus 135 divided by 2, that still would give you 35, 135. Okay? Question. So let's show the solution. Our variance 1 is... Uh, note that S variance 1 is equal to variance 2, which is 135 in this example, which means to say you have 135 plus 135 divided by 2, that will give you 135. This is the pole variance. For the example I left, okay, 135. Remember that in test uh, testing of null hypothesis, there were there were six steps. Can someone recall those six steps, please? Just raise your hands and then tell us the six steps in doing test in testing uh, null hypothesis. Yes, Alon. So the six steps of hypothesis testing is first step R. or the R, R. Sorry, sir. The the first the step one is state the hypothesis. Step two, select the statistical and the significance level. Step three, select the sample and collect the data. Step four, find the region of, of rejection. Step five, calculate the test statistics. And finally, step six is make the statistical decision. Okay. Now, there is uh, here is a, the situation here. The research hypothesis is that Participants who take vitamin C will be sick fewer days than the participants who take the placebo. Placebo is like a medicine that doesn't have any effect at all. So it's just used for the purpose of uh, doing a uh, doing some test or experiment. So it's like uh, two, two sets of people or two sets of groups. Example, uh, girls here, all the girls and all the boys. So one group, the boys, receives the vitamin C. The other group receives the placebo. So the one who receives the placebo is just like eat, uh, eating candy. doesn't have any effect at all. But in order not to, to alter the result, they were still given a medicine thinking that they're also taking vitamin C so that there will no biases. Because think, uh, you know, the power of mind, I'm not taking so I is I'm all vulnerable something so to just to avoid that uh, one so everybody were given uh, medicine but the truth is one group actually receives a vitamin C while the other group receives a placebo okay 
Now, that's our testing of null hypothesis. I mean, that is our assumption. Now, making it here, our the claim here says that the number of sick days, the average of number, the average uh, number of sick days for those who take vitamin C and those who took the placebo is significantly different. Okay? Meaning to say, those who are taking placebo and those who are taking vitamin C, when it comes to number of sick days, they do not have the same average number of sick days. That's the claim. Making now that there is a statistical significance when you take the vitamin C, more than those who are only taking the placebo. So first step is we will state our hypothesis. How do we write our HO? HO is written to be this way. Mu is mu one is equal to mu two, implying that the average sick days of taking the med the med taking the vitamin C in the placebo is no difference at all. Okay, that's the meaning of this one. So or you can state it as mu one is minus mu two is just equal to zero. Meaning to say the difference when you subtract the mean of the group one, the, the placebo group, and then the mean of the vitamin, the, 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 the VC is zero. Meaning to say no difference at all. Okay? So in this example, I can write the null hypothesis as mu C, that's the placebo, the vitamin C group, is equal to mu P, the placebo group. Or that's mu C minus mu P equals to zero. What is the implying statement for this one? It means to say there is no, there is no significant, significant difference between the means of the two groups, okay? So this one implying that there is a significant, di significant difference between the means of the two groups. That's our null, step one. And then what about our alternative? Now, we always embrace the idea that to be safe in our hypothesis testing is that we claim that there is a significant difference, but we do not prescribe as to whether there is greater impact or lesser impact. Okay? Because what if the chance is the impact we claim is greater, but the direction of our test result really, uh, yields towards the opposite, so we cannot make further conclusion anymore. That's why we would embrace a, an alternative hypothesis that is non-directional, implying that uh, there is a significant difference between the means of the two groups. So how do we write it in symbol form? It would be like this. It could be mu C is not equal to mu P, meaning to say the average sick days of those who are taking vitamin C is not the same with the average sick days of those who are taking the, play, the placebo or no medicine or no vitamin C at all. We can also write it in this form. Mu C minus mu P is less than uh, mu uh, less than zero or either way you can have it this one uh, greater than but as combined it will just lead us to this one but we cannot take it separately in order to have this because if you have it in this form this is directional meaning to say uh but th those who are taking vitamin c will have less than six days compared to those who are who do not if you will take this result here uh this symbol implying that those who are taking vitamin C uh, is having more sick days than the uh, placebo group. So you have to understand now that why this is happening, it's because um, the placebo group, uh, I mean, sorry, the vitamin C group minus the placebo group, if you will take this example, it is now giving us the result that those who are taking vitamin C are having more sick days compared to those who do not have if you will take this direction 
if you will take this the direction here, it implies that those who are taking vitamin C will have lesser number of six days, six days compared to those who do not have vitamin C. But to be safe, that's why we would uh, incur or we will only subscribe to this one directional because we don't like to predict whether what whichever is the, the truth. Uh, but we just wanted to prove that the number of sick days for those who are taking vitamin C and do not take vitamin C is not the same. Okay? To have a statistical decision that is not the same. So our statement here is that there is a significant difference between the two means of, uh, there is a single difference between the two means. You can actually discuss this one in details. Like for example, there is a significant difference between the average sick days. Actually the, the, the full sentence of this one, if I, if I only have enough space is like this. There is no significant difference between the number of sick days of those who are taking vitamin C uh, and those who are taking placebo. And then the alternative would be this way. There is no significant difference between the number of sick days for those who are taking vitamin C uh, <clears throat> compared to the number of sick days of those who are taking placebo or no vitamin C at all. Okay, that is a perhaps like a complete sentence. But since I only have minimal space here, I only just uh, make it like this. That there is a there is a difference and then there is a difference between their means. Okay, but in an actual <clears throat> sentence, you have to state it really what's really being claimed or what's the hypothesis is all about. Like for example, there is no significant difference between the number of sick days of those who are taking vitamin C and uh, those who are not taking vitamin C. And then the alternative would be there is a significant difference between the number of between the average number of sick days of those who are taking vitamin C uh, compared to those who do not take vitamin C. Okay, that is the actual statement. <clears throat> anyway, <clears throat> we did already the step one. Are we good with step one? Any question? We have stated already our null hypothesis. Okay, let's have step two. Select the statistical test and the level of significance. In this case, uh, our test statistics is T, T test for two independent independent samples okay and then our conservative alpha here is 0 0.05 as always so we have already stated this one what's the next step okay so we will now do uh, we will select the data and collect the sample okay. we will select we will Select the sample and collect the data, sir. We will select the samples and collect the data. Now, in this scenario, in an actual testing here, is you really go to the to your environment and then look for this people who are taking the vitamin C and then the placebo, and then you record their uh, number of sick days, and then get their means and then the standard deviation. That is the the protocol, or at least the gathering of the data for step three. But for the purpose of discussion, we don't actually have that one, so we'll just make an assumption right away. So in this uh, assumption, we will assume that our NC is 12. Actually, uh, in this practice, is like both those who take vitamin C and those who do not, they're both 12. So 12. Uh, individuals who took the vitamin C and then 12 individuals that is assigned for the placebo. But in the event, during the, uh, the, the, the process of the experiment, two placebo members uh, was honest enough to tell that they forgot to drink the placebo. So instead of having N's, NP equals 12, NP turns out to be NP equals 10. Because the two members forget or forgot to take their placebo med. So with that, so this is now our new instances. So if you look at this one, our 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 sample sizes are already unequal. Originally, 
in the actual experiment, there, are, there it is supposed to be equal sizes. But, due to forgetfulness of two members of the placebo group, so we reduced the placebo group into 10. So we ended up now having an equal variances. Step four, I'll just write down step four here. Step four, what's the next step? Okay, we will indicate now the region, the rejection region. So step four, we will indicate the rejection region. But in order for us to um, assign now our critical value, we need our DF. What is the degree of freedom in this problem? Anyone? What is the DF in this problem? Take note, we have an equal variances. I already gave you somewhere here, here earlier on how to identify the DF for equal and unequal sizes. In this case, we have an equal sizes, which is N1, the vitamin C group is 12, while the placebo group is 10. So what must be our DF? 20. Okay, that is uh, given to us as N1 plus N2 minus 2, which is 12 plus 10 equals 20, uh, sorry, 12 plus 10 minus 2 would give us 22 minus 2 equals 20. So our DF is 20. If our DF is 20, what is our T critical? T crit. 2.08. What is our uh, T critical? That's 20. And then under two tail tests with alpha 0 0.05, we have 2.08. Six. 2.086. That's 2.0. That's 2.086. Now, since it's two tail, there are two rejection regions. Negative 2.086, while the other one is positive 2.086. Now, in the event that we, when we reject our hypothesis, if our T computed landed here, reject. While the other one, if we landed here, reject also. But if it landed somewhere in between, our decision is accept. Okay, accept the null hypothesis. So we have already illustrated here our rejection region. What's the next step? In this case, since we don't have the actual data gathered, let's just make an assumption. Step five, let's assume that uh, XC, the mean of the vitamin C group is, let's say their mean is, 4.25 uh, days. So the average number of sick days for the those who, take, who are taking a vitamin C is 4.25 days. And then the mean for those who do not, the placebo group is 7.75 days. Okay? And then the S for this group the standard deviation is three days. While the placebo group, their standard deviation is four days. Okay? So we have these uh, assumptions considering that we don't have the actual data. Now, first thing that we need to do is we'll do the pool variances. Now, I would rather, actually, we have two options. We can embed the formula of the Pool variances in our t value to compute. I think we can we can just do that one so that we will not have a very long solution. So first, remember our formula that is x bar one minus x bar two minus mu one minus mu two divided by the square root of our pool variances our s uh, s squared p or s p squared times n uh, times the quantity of a, 1 over n1 plus a, 1 over n2. But I will not separately solve for the full variances. I'm going to embed it in my formula for solving the t. I would have now, what's that? If I remember it correctly, n1 minus 1 is 1 squared plus n2 minus 1 times s1 squared divided by n1 plus n2 minus 2, then times the quantity of 1 over n1 plus 1 over n2. Am I correct? Can you, uh, did I uh, recall it correctly? 
the formula. I think this is the correct one, the correct formula. Yes, yes, this yes, is the yes, formula yes. for the SP. Remember the full variance and then the remaining sides here. Okay, so let's solve for the T. Our mean one is 4.25 days. So that's 4.25 days minus 1 <laughs> times our... Now, this time, this is minus the mean of the placebo is 7.75. Then minus... This time, our population, the assumption that they are equal... The population for this is testing on the hypothesis. Let's assume that the population here are equal. Uh, their means are equal. So this is simply zero minus zero. And then divided by okay. N1, our N1 is what is our N1 already here? Well, right. So that's 12 minus 1 times the take note. This is uh, very, very yes, but our given is a standard deviation, so we have to square this to get what is our S1 squared? The answer is various variance. It is nine days, right? The square of three is nine, and then our S2 is 16 days for the variance because. Our given was actually in standard deviation form. So we have to square it to get the variance, which is this time now 9 and 16. So the next thing that we will do is what? We will substitute n. This is times 9 plus n2 minus 1. Our n2 is a several group. Where am I? Here, n minus 1 times 16 divided by 12 plus 10 minus 2. Then multiplied to our, that's 1, over our n1 is 12 plus 1 over 10. Correct? For this value here, our n1 is uh, our n1 is 12, our n2 is 10. So we have now the value. So let's solve. That's 4.25 minus 7.75. Negative 3.5. For the numerator, for the denominator. That is 11 times 9, 99 plus, wait, 9 times 16, 9 times 16 plus 99 divided by 22 minus 2 divided by 20, divided by 20. It's 12.15, this is 12.15. And then times this one, one, the denominator here, that's, 1 over 12 plus 1 over 20, uh, 10 rather. The GCF is 120. 120 divided by 12, that's 10 times 1, that's 10 plus 10, that's 12. That's why you have 22 over 120, lower term. Anyway, I'll just input this one. So that's 22 over 120 times this one. What will be the answer? I'll just let's make it right now. Wait. 3.5 minus 3.5 divided by the square root of the quantity 12.15 times 22 divided by 120, close, close, double close. Ah. Ah, one, okay. It's 232 They have it. So we have already step 5. Our T computed is negative 2.345. What's the next step after we have computed the T? 
make our statistical decision. Now let's write our statistical decision. Since, okay, step six, since the T critical, that is what's the T critical? Ah, I raised it already. What's our T critical? It's six. Two point. Two point. Positive negative. Zero. That is positive negative 2.086, right? Yes, yes, sir. Is greater than or less than our computed T? Is less than. Uh -huh. Refer it to the negative because this is negative. So, uh, actually, what we need to do is decide the negative than. here and then look greater at the positive. Than. Greater than. Okay. Since our, you know, if it's like this, you know, you have to pay attention with how you're going to write it here. We will use the word less than if we focus on the negative value because our T computed here is negative. So we will uh, compare it to the negative side. We will look at this side here on the distribution. But if we will disregard the negative here in our computer, then we will focus it here. We will use the greater than symbol because the rejection actually is in the right uh, the Right side. So, but since we did not uh, remove the negative here, negative two points uh, is greater than greater than the t compt that is our t comp is negative two point three four five at what percent of alpha at 0 0.05 level of significant gas this is one okay if we look at this one let me let us uh, highlight this area the rejection is in this area now if you will locate this value this one where it is located on the shaded region or non-shaded? Referring to the half of the region. In the shaded region. Shaded region. Reject. This is what this does. Reject the null hypothesis. Okay? Hypothesis. So, let's recall our decision. Since the T critical that is positive or negative 2.086 is greater than the T computed that is negative 2.345 at 5% uh, 5 level of significance. Significance, this is significance. Significance does reject the null hypothesis. There you go, our decision. So what is our conclusion now? Remember our conclusion, our hypothesis and the null hypothesis says that there is no significant difference between the number of sick days of those who are taking vitamin C uh, compared to those, the number of sick days of those who are not taking vitamin C. That is the null hypothesis. But since we rejected that hypothesis, what is our conclusion? There is a conclusion. Our conclusion, I don't have enough space anymore. Can I just, can I erase this portion so we can write uh, a more vivid and a more yes, sir. Uh, complete conclusion statement? Because our null hypothesis, I wasn't able to make it in a full statement form because uh, I don't have enough space. Actually, when I talked to Sir Alo, when we talked, uh, when I talked to Sir Alo last time, who is going to handle, by the way, your experimental research, which most of these ideas will come out or come uh, come out again. He told me the sir, just emphasize to them how to write the equivalent statement more than just the symbol, because I noticed most of the students, they know how to write the symbol, but they don't know how to interpret the symbol in word form. So that's why we're going to emphasize this portion. Okay, the conclusion would go this way. Conclusion. 
since we rejected the null hypothesis, by the way, I'll just uh, write this, the null hypothesis here so that everybody can follow. Our null hypothesis in statement form was there is no significant difference between the number of sick days of those who are taking vitamin C and uh, to those and those who did not. Okay, that is at least in sentence four, full sentence four. There is no significant difference between the number of sick days of those who are taking vitamin C and those who did, who did not. So we need to say the average sick days of those taking vitamin C and those who are not taking vitamin C are just the same. Making it that if you're testing here the vitamin C, you better not take the vitamin C because there's no effect at all. Okay, based on the statistical result. If the, the null hypothesis wasn't rejected, but in our conclusion, in our decision here, we rejected the null hypothesis in this one. So our conclusion would simply like this, will be like this. Conclusion. There is a, there is, there is a statistical, I'm sorry. You know, you can always make your own statement. Just make sure that the core of your statement is there. Now, I'll, it's my turn now to make my own statement uh, the way I wanted to position it, just making it sure that uh, I won't lose the, 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 I won't lose the substance of my conclusion. Like, let me process that one. Uh, there is no significant difference. There is a that, uh... okay, and my conclusion. Statistically, uh huh. You know, you can make your own statement. Statistically, it shows that there is a significant difference between the number of sick days of those who are taking vitamin C compared to those who do not. At 5% level of significant. Actually, why would I intend to include this one? Because we could have another conclusion at different alpha. Okay, that's why I decided to include it in my conclusion. Again, statistically, it shows that there is a significant difference between the number of sick days of those who are taking vitamin C compared to those who do not at 5% level of significance. 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 Okay? I indicated my alpha value here because I could have or I might have different conclusion as much as decision at different alpha. Okay? Any question about my statement of the conclusion? You know, I cannot make a conclusion such as statistically it shows that there is a significant or statistically it shows that those who are taking vitamin C have more or have lesser number of sick days compared to compared to those who are not. I cannot say that because in my alternative hypothesis, I did not specifically identify where my direction is. Whether uh, those who are taking vitamin C will have lesser number of uh, lesser number of sick days compared to those who are who do not, or whether those who are taking vitamin C will have more number of sick days compared to those who are not. I did not I did not specify direction in my alternative. That's why to be safe in my conclusion, I will not also point a direction because. Conclusion class, by the way, is different from implication. Did you understand? Conclusion is just your concluding statement based on the result. Implication, on the other hand, is you're going to imply something based on the result, based on the conclusion that you've gathered or you stated. You are going to make now an assumption. You're making you're making an implication of what is the what is the what is the impact of this conclusion? Okay, so. But sometimes making implication is quite uh, not safe at all because 
statistically, there is limitation to your result. In this case, I cannot imply that, for example, my decision here is to reject the null hypothesis, which is uh, there is no difference between the number of sick days of those. I cannot make an implication here that uh, uh, my conclusion is that there is a significant difference between the number of sick days of those who are taking vitamin C compared to those who do not at 5% level of significance. That's my conclusion. But I cannot imply now that uh, implying that those who are taking vitamin C will have lesser number of sick days compared to those who are not um, compared to those who are not taking vitamin C. So as a result, it is um, uh, it is advised that people must take vitamin C to reduce the risk of uh, being sick. So I cannot make that implication because after all, I end up using my alternative hypothesis that is non-directional. Okay, so one thing that I can imply now is that I'm certain for a fact, or I'm certain that the number of sick days of those who are taking vitamin C and do not take vitamin C are not the same. That's the only thing I can claim or imply based on my result. But I cannot say anything that whether who happens to have a greater number of sick days and who happens to have a less than number of sick days because my hypothesis testing does not cover that. Mm -hmm.